Okay, and if you allow, uh, 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 if you allow, uh, Emanuela, I will just make a brief introduction as you wrote, and then uh, we, we start with your presentation. Of course, I will be very brief. Uh, um, so thanks, friends, uh, especially a big welcome to our new friends, uh, Eunice, Deborah, Mercedes, and whom we have, uh, it's the first time I think we have met virtually, and hopefully one day we could see you guys in Geneva or somewhere else um, uh, physically. So today we have for the honor uh, to invite Emmanuel from the WTO Research uh, Division to share with us, uh, uh, share with us uh, uh, her insights on one topic, uh, which always make me very uh, kind of mentally, feel mentally handicapped, uh, the blockchain. Uh, uh, of course, I, 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 I'm not the only one among the group uh, to understand what blockchain it is and how that could be related to trade and the system, the, which is the focus uh, of our group here. So, so I won't say anything about that, but just uh, thank you a lot, uh, Emmanuel, for being with us. And we, like I said, we, we, are, we are eager to listen to you and, uh, and understand this thing. Uh, and uh, thanks a lot for being with us. I think uh, we can uh, start now. Thanks a lot, Emmanuel. Yes, well, thank you very much uh, for the uh, for the intro and uh, for the for the invitation uh, to present on uh, blockchain for trade. So let me share my screen. And good to see so many uh, known faces. I wouldn't say around the table, but on the call. <laughs> Hopefully, around the table very soon again. Uh, so uh, let's see. can you see it now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so blockchain, um, blockchain for trade and how it relates to international trade as, as you were saying. So I understand we have until 3 p.m., right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll keep some time at the end for Q&As, but if you have a question in the course of the presentation, don't hesitate to, to raise your hand. Uh, happy to answer a question um, as, uh, as I speak. So what I wanted to uh, cover were three things. First, um, I'll say a little bit about blockchain and distributed ledger technology, give uh, some, uh, some information on, on how it works, et cetera, so that you uh, better understand how it relates uh, or how it can help international trade. Then I will talk about some potential um, use cases or actual use cases for trade. And um, as a third point, I will discuss some key issues that need to be addressed if we want the technology to actually uh, really make a difference for international trade. So let me start with the more technical part on what is blockchain and DLT. Uh, but maybe before I start, like how familiar are you with blockchain? Like, do I need to go back to the basics? Yeah, or, I think so. Yes, okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, so if I get too technical, please stop me. <laughs> so what is blockchain DLT? The first thing that I want to say is that blockchain is not Bitcoin. It's not the same thing. Bitcoin is an application of blockchain technology, just like an email is an application of the internet. So I really want to make that distinction because for many people, blockchain is Bitcoin and it's cryptocurrencies only. Now, when we talk about the potential of blockchain or DLT for international trade, we talk more about what is called enterprise blockchain. And um, you will see when I go to the part on use cases that many of the use cases, actually all of them, all the use cases that I will present are really about enterprise blockchain and not cryptocurrencies. I'm happy to answer questions about cryptocurrencies, but this presentation is not on cryptocurrencies. It's on the technology itself and what it can do for international trade and how it could potentially transform international trade. So what is blockchain? Well, it's a database, it's a digital database, a ledger, but it has some specific characteristics that make it interesting for a number of applications, including for international trade. First, it is decentralized meaning that there is no central entity that controls the database. You have a number of what we call the nodes that are connected to the system, so computers that are connected to the system. And all these nodes have a copy of the records that are on the database. So we, we use the term distributed. It's decentralized because you have many different computers 
and it's distributed because the data is distributed and is uh, housed in each of these nodes, which makes it uh, highly secure because if you want to attack blockchain, you would have to attack more than half of the computers, basically. It's, uh, it allows for peer-to-peer -peer interaction. And uh, this is one thing that is very often put forward. You don't need, for example, to go through a bank. You can interact directly with your peers. And this is very interesting when it comes to international trade because there are many different actors involved in international trade. So with blockchain, you can basically connect them to the same database and they can interact on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, which means that it can be immediate uh, real-time reconciliation. And uh, there's an expression that is often used, which is what you see is what I see. So we can act, interact directly and be sure that what's on the ledger, what you see is what I see as well. So that there's truth behind it. Highly secure, as I said, because it's decentralized, distributed, but also because it uses cryptography. And I will uh, talk in a, in a moment about the concept of hashing, which is very often used. Uh, I'm not going to use too many technical terms or go too deep into the, the technical aspects, but there are certain terms that, that are important and, and hashing is one of them. Um, it is tamper-proof. It's very, very difficult to play with the data when it has been added to the ledger. So that gives you the, the security that what has been added to the ledger has not been uh, played with along the way and it makes it possible uh, to, um, to build trust and to, to allow for traceability, for example, of products along the, along the supply chain. Uh, it's timestamped, so when you add a record to the ledger, it's timestamped, and here again, it's a, a feature that is very interesting for traceability uh, purposes. And another important feature is that the records or the blocks are linked to one another. Uh, and I will discuss it a bit more uh, in, a, in a moment, but the fact that they are linked means that if you want to attack blockchain, if you change one block or one transaction, the previous ones will be changed as well. So you can very easily see, for example, where there has been manipulation. This is why it is so, so, um, so secure because it's very difficult to play with uh, the, the data, but also you can very um, immediately see where there was a problem. And if you want, I mean, if someone wants to play with the data and wants it to not to be discovered, it would have to change all the previous transactions or all the previous blocks, which obviously is, is very, uh, very complex. And uh, finally, another interesting feature is the feature um, of uh, smart contracts, and I will come back to it in a, in a moment, um, which allows to automate transactions. So these are the different technical aspects of what uh, blockchain is. Now I talked about decentralized versus distributed. Uh, you have here on, um, on the screen, a traditional centralized ledger with a central server that then sends information to the different computers. When we talk about decentralization distributed, this is what you have on the right-hand side with different nodes, different computers connected to the system. The data is, as I said, um, with each computer. And uh, so you have a purely uh, yeah, decentralized and distributed system. Now, concept of hashing that I mentioned, it's a, a very important uh, feature. It's a, it's a cryptographic technique that is used uh, for blockchain and for, for other, uh, in other digital technologies. It's, it's like a digital fingerprint. And a hash is a unique, so you can have any type of, uh, of, of asset, digital assets. You use, you apply a mathematical formula that will give you a hash. And this hash is unique. And it's, um, a hash has always the same length. But if you change one small thing in the, the data that you input into the system, you get a completely different hash. And this is what you have here. If you input lawyer, for example, you see the hash on the screen that you get. If you put an S, lawyers, you see a completely different hash. And so this is how data is encrypted. And why is it very interesting? because it's very difficult to calculate backwards. So it, it really uh, adds in terms of, of security. Now, this hash is being used to link the different records and the different transactions. As I said, uh, these records and transactions are, are linked, uh, meaning that the hash of the previous block appears in the subsequent uh, block. So if you change one block, you need to update all the blocks 
not, not to be discovered. Uh, so this ensures immutability and allowed, allows for uh, traceability, as I already mentioned. Now, a few more concepts. Uh, the concept of consensus protocol, this is the way the transactions are validated and added to uh, a blockchain, to a ledger. There are a number of different consensus protocols. I've mentioned here uh, a few of them, the most well-known ones, the one which is proof of work, that is used by the Bitcoin network, um, but which uses a very, very high level of energy because basically here is the computing power, how much computing power you have to uh, solve a cryptographic puzzle that matters and that allows you to validate a block. Um, and those who validate the blocks in the case of Bitcoin are called the miners. But each blockchain has its own consensus protocol. Uh, they differ in the way they work. For example, in the case of Ethereum, which is another uh, blockchain, what matters is how much stake you have in the network, that this is what gives you the possibility to validate uh, the, the blocks. And you have many others that differ in terms of uh, rapidity of validation of blocks, but also in terms of security. Not all blockchains are equal, and this is very important to bear in mind. They, these consensus protocols work in different ways. The most secure one is considered to be the proof of work. The other ones, uh, proof of stake is also highly secure, but you have some protocols that are less secure than others. I was referring to a uh, blockchain. Now, blockchain is actually only one type of distributed ledger technology, but it's a term that we very often use to refer to DLT, distributed ledger technology, just because it's easier. It's a, it's a catchy term, <laughs> uh, but it does create some confusion. In fact, uh, there are many different distributed ledger technologies and blockchain is only one of them. But to make it easier, uh, I will use blockchain in the sense of DLT as, as many people do. Uh, now, strictly speaking, a blockchain is composed of blocks that are linked to each other in a linear way. But you have a number of other distributed ledger technologies that instead of linking blocks, we link transactions. So they don't combine the transactions in a block, but every time there's a transaction that comes in, it's added to the ledger. And sometimes they are not linked in a linear way, but they are linked more like in a, in a tangle, for example. And here, this is the tangle um, of uh, IOTA, which is another DLT, this related technology, that shows you that it's, it's, quite, it's organized in a quite different manner. So it's a rather complex field. When we say blockchain, it's not one technology, it's not one consensus protocol, it's not one type of validating transactions or adding them to the ledger. You have many different configurations uh, that do have an impact, as I said, in terms of uh, the level um, of uh, either security or the speed at which you can uh, validate transactions. So that was about the technology itself. Now, when we say blockchain, we also very often use it to refer to a blockchain platform. So when I will talk about the use cases um, in the case of international trade, I will talk here about the platforms. And the fact is that you have public or private blockchains and permissioned and permissionless blockchains. Now, the public ones like Bitcoin, for example, um, can are accessible to anyone, open to anyone, anyone can read the information. Uh, if it's a private blockchain, it's usually a private company having that blockchain and it's limited in terms of the number of participants. And same thing, permissioned a lot of uh, cases when it comes to international trade are actually permission blockchains. So only certain companies will participate in the platform and will have the right to either write the information onto the ledger or to read this information. So you have a lot of different configurations that, that exist with different levels of centralization as well. So not only do you have different technologies, but in terms of the platforms, you have different types of platforms, whether they're private, public, permissioned, or permissionless, and different levels of centralization. Obviously, a private blockchain is quite close to today's centralized ledgers because you have one private company developing the blockchain. They are very rare. And some people say, well, they are actually not blockchains because they're not decentralized. What you see, uh, generally speaking, are consortium blockchains 
or public blockchain or hybrid of private and public. We also see that more and more now. But so this is just to say that the degree of decentralization varies. And obviously a public blockchain is more secure than the private one or consortium blockchain because you have fewer nodes in the case of a private or a consortium blockchain. And so that leads to the blockchain trilemma um, that uh, Vitalik of Ethereum, um, I mean, it's a term that, that he came up with, meaning that you always have a trade-off between uh, decentralization, scalability, and security. So you can have a highly secure blockchain and fully decentralized blockchain like Bitcoin, for example, but then scalability is much more complex. I mean, it, tends, it takes about 10 minutes to validate um, a block on the, on the Bitcoin um, network. Or you can have more centralized blockchain platforms uh, or systems um, that are much easier to scale up, but then you lose a little bit in terms of security. So there's always this, uh, this trade-off between um, these, uh, these different dimensions. Now, a few other concepts. Uh, the concept of smart contracts. Uh, it's very often used in the context um, of uh, Bitcoin applications. The, it's actually a misnomer because these, uh, these smart contracts are neither smart in the sense that they have no AI component to them. And they are not contracts in the legal sense of the term. They are actually just computer programs that automatically enforce themselves when certain conditions are met. For example, when temperature rises above, I don't know, 20 degrees, then, uh, I don't know, or, or below, let's say below 10 degrees, uh, minus 10, then insurance is paid if, uh, if it's being used in the case of an insurance contract. Or when a truck crosses the border, then uh, duties are being paid. Uh, so it's a bit like an electronic vending machine. I mean, if you put the money in, you get what you want, like your drink or your, uh, uh, your snack. Uh, here, if certain conditions are met, it automatically executes. And they are very often used in the case of, uh, of blockchain applications. So this is about uh, blockchain and the technical, uh, technical aspects of, of blockchain. Now, what are the different use cases of um, DLT in trade? So why first blockchain for trade? I mean, there are a number of uh, issues that um, companies or, or stakeholders are trying to solve um, leveraging the, the technology. First, the fact that it, the trade remains very labor, paper intensive. Uh, there are uh, 20 to 40 documents being required for a trade transaction. If you want to ship a container from Mombasa to Rotterdam, you end up with a pile of paper that is 25 centimeters high. So this creates a lot of inefficiencies, redundancies. It's uh, prone to fraud error. We saw uh, quite a few, I mean, there, there were some recent scandals in, um, in Asia um, with, uh, with fraud uh, and trade documents, bills of lading being uh, double spent. There are multiple players, uh, the importer, the exporter, the, uh, the carrier, the shipper, the customs agencies or other government agencies, um, uh, banks, etc. that all tend to work in, in silo and have their own ledger and their own databases and their own data. There's very low supply chain visibility, uh, about 10% between tier one suppliers and even lower uh, when, it, when we go to tier two or tier three. And there is a persistent trade finance gap uh, that um, affects um, small and medium-sized enterprises very significantly. It has, been, it has been estimated by the Asian Development Bank at 1.5 trillion over the past few years. It looks like it's uh, on the rise right now. And um, as I said, SMEs really struggle to, to access trade finance. And so these different issues have prompted a number of actors to uh, look at how they could leverage a blockchain or DLT uh, to try and solve these issues and, and improve trade processes. So why um, is it uh, so, so interesting? What does it bring? Um, it goes back to some of the points that I mentioned earlier. So greater security, you can transfer assets via this ledger, you have this peer-to-peer -peer interaction, time stamping and automation, and all of this allows for greater transparency into trade processes, into the journey of a product, 
from farm to fork, for example. Um, and so it allows for traceability along the supply chain. When I was saying that the, the either the blocks or the transactions are timestamped, that they are linked, uh, at stri you can really trace the journey of a product back to, to its origin and see where there may have been some potential issues. And so these create trusts. Um, and this is, this is why it has been explored uh, for a number of use cases that I will um, uh, detail now. In terms of the key benefits, so I've, um, I will show in a, in a moment the periodic table that uh, we, uh, we developed with um, uh, Deepesh Patel of Trade Finance Global trying to map the different projects, uh, DLT projects in, in trade. And we also did a survey of stakeholders in the field trying to better understand what they saw as the key benefits of DLT for trade. The top three benefits uh, that came out of the survey were first transparency between all the parties, gain in speed and efficiency because they can interact on a peer-to-peer -peer basis on that, the, the platform and real-time overview of transactions and, and therefore also uh, real-time reconciliation. So main use cases in trade, a widely used <laughs> use case is in terms of a traceability along the supply chain um, because it allows for enhanced transparency on uh, how the goods are being processed. So uh, you can really track the entire journey of a product. Uh, as a consumer, you could, for example, scan the QR code and then see uh, where uh, the, uh, either the, the, the pig or fish or it came from and when uh, it was uh, shipped, where it was uh, uh, manufactured, et cetera. So you can really have that traceability. And you have a number of startups uh, or companies uh, that are active in that field. One of the first ones was, uh, was Provenance, but it's now being used by big retailers uh, like Carrefour, for example, uh, for, for chicken. Um, and why? Because if you go to a store right now, I mean, there's very little information on, on the packaging, but there's more and more um, interest of consumers to know where the product comes from, uh, what has been the journey, so that they can take informed decisions. Uh, and so this allows to also assert certain claims, uh, whether um, in terms of uh, either organic products or um, or some ethical claims, uh, provenance worked, for example, on a few projects for uh, fair trade. Um, it allows you also to quickly uh, track tainted products. Walmart uses it to, for, to that effect. So you can see where there was an issue before it took, usually they were saying, uh, according to one of their studies, a couple of weeks to identify where the origin of a, of a problem was. And using blockchain, it actually it's a matter of, uh, of hours, if not uh, minutes. It's also being used um, to fight piracy and, and counterfeiting. Uh, for example, Everledger was one of the first ones using it for diamonds. So diamond has a unique identity. If you scan it, uh, you can have the, the unique identity of a diamond. And if you put that on the blockchain, then you can have the traceability and ensure that your diamond is authentic. And you have a number of um, other brands um, fashion brands, luxury brands like LVMH, for example, that are now using it, um, incorporating a chip, for example, in the uh, in the garment or in the bag, um, and um, allowing you then to, to check the uh, the authenticity of uh, of the products. Now, one uh, thing that is very important here to flag is that the um, blockchain will only prove that what has been added to the ledger has not been tapped with, and so that the data has not been played with. But it cannot guarantee that the data that is entered into the blockchain is of good quality. So you still need those verification mechanisms off chain to ensure that the right data is entered in. Because if, I mean, it, there's the expression garbage in, garbage out. If, you, if the data that is entered says, well, this is an organic product, but in fact, it's not at all, it, it will remain as such on the blockchain. Um, but the blockchain doesn't ensure that it's an organic product if those mechanisms of chain are not there. So this is a very important thing to, uh, to, to flag and to, to bear in mind. But so very important use case, trustability along the supply chain. Then it's also being used extensively um, for trade processes to try and remove frictions from international trade. 
And this is here the periodic table that I was mentioning uh, a few minutes ago that we prepared with uh, Deepesh Patel of Trade Finance Global, trying to give an overview of the key projects when it comes to international trade. And um, I will uh, go over them, um, so one, one by one, or one block by, <laughs> by block. So the first big category of projects um, are the projects that use blockchain to digitize trade documents. So to digitize, for example, bills of lading. In spite of uh, years and years of effort of digitizing trade documents and bills of lading uh, through SDOT and, and Bolero, only 0.1% of bills of lading are actually in digital format. Why? Because current technologies do not prevent double spending. And when I was referring to the uh, cases of fraud in Singapore last year, it was the problem. They used a bill of lading and basically had it financed twice. Now with blockchain, you have the guarantee that there is no double spending because you have the guarantee that that document is the authentic one. You can't make copies. While if you just digitalize without using blockchain, you can, yeah, you can just copy your bill of lading and digitalize it several times. So um, blockchain is a very uh, popular use case when it comes to digitizing trade documents because it avoids that double spending process um, or issue. And so you have here the, the different uh, companies that are active in, in that field. And interestingly, um, as Docs and Bolero that we're not using blockchain are now turning to blockchain because they realize that it allows them to solve this uh, double spending issue. Another popular use case is trade finance. As I said, there's a big trade finance gap. And uh, here you see on the screen, uh, the, on, the, on the left of the screen, um, the number of actors involved in a single trade finance transaction, here it's a letter of credit, and the number of documents, and all the interaction back and forth. And as you can see from this graph, this creates a lot of inefficiencies. Um, in fact, the, the, the same studies the study shows that uh, for a single letter of credit transaction, there are about 5,000 data fields interactions that are created, but only 1% creates value. So a lot of inefficiencies in the process. And this is one of the reasons why uh, there have been so many projects in the area of trade finance trying to, to, to streamline and to, to remove frictions from, uh, from those processes. So we've um, listed them here in uh, light blue. In dark blue, you have all the supply chain finance projects. And there were so many of them that we couldn't even list them this time around. So we just have like a big bar. Um, but the other ones uh, that are listed there are either big consortia like Contour or um, Marco Polo that bring together different banks. So we don't trade that focuses on, on SMEs. So they bring together different banks um, and try to, to, to use blockchain to remove frictions. And for letters of credit, for example, um, there have been a number of, um, of not only proofs of concept, but also um, operations that have used blockchain, and that shows that it, it drastically reduces the time needed to complete a, a letter of credit transaction. Uh, some of them are focused on SMEs, uh, like Widow Trade, others like Congo are focused on, on commodities. Uh, others uh, are startups and not consortia. So you have a mix of different. Uh, initiatives there, but uh, quite a lot of activity in, in that field. Then also um, transportation logistics, um, a few projects out there. One that is very well known is Treadlands. You may have heard about it. It was launched in, uh, I think it was in 2018 or 19 uh, by IBM and, um, and Maersk. There are now some competitors, uh, but Treadlands is more, more advanced than the others. And here, um, what they're trying to do is to bring uh, the, the different stakeholders involved in transportation together uh, to allow them to, uh, to interact on a peer-to-peer -peer basis and, um, and here again to, to streamline processes. So here, this is taken from Treadlands and you can see um, different stakeholders today um, interact that on a bilateral basis, so there's a lot of uh, back and forth and each works in, in silo and the idea is through a blockchain platform to connect all of them to allow them to interact directly 
And because um, it's uh, well decentralized, each of them can contribute to the platform, but also um, because of the trustability and the immutability, you have the guarantee that it's not being tampered with by other players. And so the, this is actually the, the critical part of it. It creates that trust um, that two stakeholders who have to work together, do not necessarily trust each other, can use blockchain to exchange uh, information. And here it's uh, it's also taken from Tradelands just to give you an idea of the number of stakeholders, documents being involved, and uh, the idea of uh, bringing all these together through uh, through a trade line, uh, through a, a blockchain platform. So what uh, what the periodic table that I showed you um, shows are, are the number of projects, but it was actually the second periodic table that we published. We published the first one in two thousand and nineteen. Um, and what we see is an increase in the number of projects between 2019 and 2020. Um, there, there were 29 projects that we had mapped in 2019 and 44 in 2020, excluding supply chain projects. But we've also given a stage of maturity to those projects on a scale of one to five, one being proof of concept and five being fully operational. And what we see is that there is uh, steady progress towards digitalization. It went up in just a year's time from 2.3 to 3.3. So a number of projects have entered um, into the, the production stage and are actually uh, operational nowadays. But what we're seeing as well is that customs development are uh, somewhat uh, trailing. And this is confirmed by a number of discussions that I've had with customs authorities that are more in a wait and see attitude or just testing phase uh, for the moment. Uh, while the potential there is um, can be significant um, for to, to facilitate interagency coordination, to facilitate the management of certification licensing, uh, facilitate clearance of goods, you could also automate a number of processes using smart contracts like revenue collection uh, for compliance management and identity management. Uh, I, I will talk about it uh, because there is uh, the, the most advanced program or blockchain project in that sphere is um, about identity management and um, it's about AU programs, authorized economic operators. And it's a project in Latin America that is sponsored by the Inter-American Development Bank. And here the idea is to facilitate the mutual recognition of authorized economic operators. Um, there, there are a number of issues that are associate, associated with uh, such mutual recognition. Uh, in terms of errors, in terms of a time lag as well, when uh, either a company becomes an AO or loses that, um, that status. And so the Cadena project was launched a few years ago to try and, and automate um, this process and make them more, more efficient. And there's actually now a second similar project in Latin America just to show that this, this is actually uh, making a difference. It, 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 does, uh, it does help. Um, with, uh, with this dimension of mutual recognition of, uh, of AUs. I just wanted also briefly to talk about uh, applications um, regarding intellectual property beyond fighting counterfeit, um, which is something that I mentioned when I was talking about traceability along the supply chain. Um, DLT opens here interesting opportunities, um, either um, to prove the, the existence, ownership um, of, uh, of IP rights, uh, proof of use registration. So you have a number of companies that have emerged, have put one here, uh, binded, that uh, deals with copyrights. It's also being used to simplify the management. Um, and interestingly, if you use smart contracts, uh, it could help move towards what I called in my uh, 2018 book, smart IP rights. Um, for example, in the case of uh, music, I mean, you have these big platforms like Spotify or, or others. Um, using blockchain and attaching a smart contract, you could actually um, directly uh, pay the, um, the, the, the singer or the musicians uh, and, and cut the, uh, the intermediary. And this is being used actually uh, by, um, by some uh, singers and um, there's a Himachi Heap who was like one of the pioneers in, in, that, uh, in that sphere. And then it could uh, potentially help moving towards um, global IP chains. Uh, there is no such thing as a global IP right at the moment. Uh, IP rights re remain territorial. 
And there have been different attempts in the past to create global registries, but they've, they've all failed. Uh, there are some new attempts using blockchain um, to, to offer a greater transparency and, um, and immutability. And I've put here um, one of them, Consensum, uh, which is about copyright, and there is uh, another initiative uh, on, on patents. Um, it remains to be seen whether they will succeed. Um, it could potentially be interesting, but we'll have to see whether uh, they, they are actually scaled up and, um, and do, uh, yeah, do succeed. So this is in a nutshell what, uh, I mean, the different areas where blockchain is being used and what it can um, allow to do and how it could help a number of international trade processes. Uh, overall, the, the potential is, is interesting, but one thing that I really want to, to flag is that technology is only a tool and um, you need much more than the technology to actually make a difference and, and be able to digitalize trade or have end-to-end -end, uh, traceability along the supply chain. And so that's what I want to discuss now. So key issues to address. So as I said, technology is only a tool. There are a number of challenges that do need to be addressed to truly uh, digitalize trade. And the first one um, is interoperability. Now, this term is very much a catch-all term that covers different aspects. The first one is technical. As I said, there are different distributed ledger technologies using different consensus protocols. And the different projects that you saw on the periodic table use different technologies. So as you can imagine, they, these different platforms are built on different technologies and do not necessarily talk to each other. So we have an interoperability issue there. We have the problem of digital islands that use different technologies. There's a lot of work being done um, in, the, uh, in, in blockchain circles um, to try and um, address this issue of technical interoperability. But beyond that, there are other issues that would need to be solved in order to address the digital island problem we have. The first one is the question of semantics. Who means what? Uh, are we sure that when we that, that the different platforms speak the same language, that one is not going to use a port of unloading while the other one uh, use a port of discharge, for example? There are a number of libraries of some semantics that exist. What we need to make sure is that these platforms do use those library of semantics and do use the same terminology. Another important aspect when it comes to interoperability is the question of uh, data models for the different trade documents. Now, there are some data models that exist. Uh, there's one that has been developed by UNC Fact, another one developed by the uh, WCO, uh, but the fact is that we do not have data models for all the uh, all data standards for all the trade documents. They exist for certain documents, but not for all. Um, and so we need here again to develop standards for those different trade documents and develop standard data models to ensure that there is interoperability along the entire uh, supply chain and also in terms of, uh, of processes. So these issues of digital island is a critical one. Um, if you go back to the periodic table that I showed some projects were in trade finance, others in transportation logistics, um, others digitization of trade documents. An international trade transaction touches upon different ledgers. It will touch upon those different ledgers, unless you have a ledger that covers all the transactions, but it's unlikely to be the case. Um, you will touch upon a trade finance ledger, customs ledger, um, transportation ledger. So we need to solve that interoperability issue. Otherwise, we won't be able to remove frictions along the entire supply chain. Then there are uh, some uh, policy and regulatory considerations. Um, one thing that uh, I want to emphasize is the importance of regulation as an enabler, because you can have a great digital technology if your legislation still requires uh, paper documents. We won't go very far in terms of digitalizing trade. And the fact is that there are still many countries that do not recognize the signatures, do not recognize the documents. Um, UNC trial passed uh, an interesting model law in 2017, which is called the Model Law on Electronic Transfer of Record. That's the uh, MLETR, MLETR that you see here on the screen, uh, which is a key model law when it comes to trade digitalization because it allows for 
uh, transferable records like bills of lading to be transferred when they are in electronic format. And we all know this that the bill of lading is a critical document in international trade because it proves ownership of the goods. So if you want to digitalize trade, you need to be able to transfer that document. And this is what this model law allows. But only three jurisdictions to date have transposed the model law, and the UK is working on it uh, very actively. But so we need uh, governments to take action on these fronts um, for the, the technology to work to its full potential. Otherwise, we won't go uh, very far. Then there are some legal issues um, that uh, come with the use of blockchain. Um, as I said, um, smart contracts are not really legal contracts. So what's the status of a smart contract? Uh, could it be legally enforceable? Uh, what's the uh, legal status of a blockchain transaction? The, um, the, the Chinese Supreme Court actually um, uh, broke new ground in that respect um, a couple of years ago by acknowledging that uh, the blockchain transaction could be enforceable in court. Um, but we have to see whether this is the case in other jurisdictions. So there are some legal issues that need to be uh, to be settled. Some more specific to trade, for example, a customs officer was telling me once, well, this is great to be using blockchain for, uh, for customs clearance, but the fact is that we have this concept of declarance, uh, but with the blockchain, each stakeholder can add to the ledger. So you have potentially many declarants. So who is liable at the end of the day? And we need to solve this issue if we want to be able to use blockchain. And interestingly, when we did the mapping, we did a survey of what were the key challenges that um, stakeholders using blockchain for trade were facing and legal challenges came as the number one. So the uncertainty regarding the regulatory framework uh, and the, the lack of, uh, of legal framework in, in certain cases. So this is clearly something to, uh, to be addressed. And I see that actually time is passing. So <laughs> let me go a bit quicker. Uh, what role for the WTO? Uh, as uh, you, you all know, there are discussions on, um, on, on e-commerce uh, at the WTO. Uh, but here, I think, I mean, there could be a, a bigger role for the organization as such. And I get phone calls almost every day by either private sector organizations or saying, well, we need a public private dialogue. We need uh, like one of these organizations to play the role of convener so that we all move in the same direction. Um, so there's uh, here a key role to play, I think, as a convener to support the development and use of global standards to avoid silos, because one of the key problems is that we, we see a lot of initiatives, but here again, they're all developed in silo and there is no coordination between these different initiatives. Now the ICC, uh, the International Chamber of Commerce, recently launched um, a digital standards initiative to try and, and coordinate action on this front and, and solve these issues. And uh, we, we participate in that initiative, so hopefully it will, it will help. Then in terms of transparency to collect information and policy measures uh, that, that are being uh, taken uh, to avoid also potentially a regulatory fragmentation. Um, I think this is one area where very little is being done and it would be great to do more. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of training <laughs> that, that is required on these issues that are Quite, uh, quite technical um, to, uh, to, to try and advance uh, the thinking around that. And um, yeah, so leverage research to inform rulemaking. And so just to conclude, um, I do think that because of its specific features of uh, immutability, high security, uh, the trust that it generates, um, the fact that it avoids double spending, it is a technology that has potentially large and significant impact but we need to make sure that we develop the right policy environment to not only promote blockchain innovations, but also to support trade digitalization. So regulation as, as an enabler. And on that, it's very important, I think, to, to really have um, a dialogue at, a, at an international level involving all the stakeholders to try and push um, these, uh, these issues uh, in a coordinated manner in, in the right direction. Um, and so, um, yes, key role, I think, for international organizations such as the, uh, the WTO. And I'll finish here. And if you want to know more, here are uh, some of my publications on the topic and the link to the latest uh, Global Trade and Blockchain Forum that took place in March of this year, where we discussed one thing that I haven't mentioned is digital identity, um, which is also an area where blockchain um, is being explored and, and could be interesting. Um, so there were some different sessions on trade finance, digital identity, digitalization of trade processes, if you're interested. So sorry, so I was longer than expected.
and you were very silent. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. Stop sharing. No, thanks. Thanks, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, really enjoyable presentation. Uh, I, I'm not sure for others, but for me, it's that I feel uh, less uh, mentally handicapped, but still uh, struggling to understand, uh, especially with the cases you say. Uh, I, I will just see whether our friends, or whoever has questions, probably uh, just raise your hand or, or simply or open your, or mute yourself and uh, try to, to, to pose your questions. Uh, maybe someone. Uh, for me, it's just one a very simple question is that uh, the, uh, what I understand from your presentation is that blockchain is a technology which is uh, ready to be used, like you said, to digitalization documents, to use to facilitate trade, uh, enhance cooperation among different customs, so on and so forth. But you do need a, a service company who can do this blockchain service and to provide the service so you could do that. You need to pay them, is right? It's not like a, anything on the website, you could just go in and you get a blockchain for whatever. No, and actually putting in place a blockchain platform is quite complex um, and, and costly. So, uh, I mean, I doubt you will see small companies, for example, developing blockchains, but also there's no interest in developing a blockchain on your own. I mean, it's usually a group of, of companies, for example, that will develop a, a blockchain when it comes to international trade, so a consortium. Um, but yes, you do need the, the technology provider. And so if um, if you, well, I've uh, stopped sharing my, my screen, but if you go back to the periodic table, I can share the slides. Um, you will see that we've put in the corner the technology that is being used, and you have service providers for that. So you have for example, a well-known company, R3, uh, R3 Quota, is uh, developing a number of blockchain platforms in the area of trade finance. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have uh, yeah, the, the Hyper Ledger um, uh, consensus, which is the, the company selling the Hyper, uh, the uh, sorry, the Ethereum uh, technology that develops um, blockchain platforms. Uh, jointly with companies, so helping them to put in place the, uh, the blockchain. Okay, thanks a lot. Johnson, would you please uh, yeah, unmute yourself and pose your question? Thanks. Manuel, uh, thank you. Uh, a couple of questions, and maybe it's unfair since you're sitting in research rather than uh, outreach, although obviously your work has engaged you with a number of others. Number one, uh, building on your important observation that the most important uh, thing to address is uh, to avoid garbage in, garbage out. Um, how are you folks connecting to those who provide uh, or can help uh, certify the entities and the transactions? So you've got, for example, the Global Legal Entity Identifier Program quite uh, independently of the WTO. Uh, that's a remarkable database of uh, reliable uh, businesses. Um, on the electronic signature side, UNCITRAL has long been uh, working on that. Um, on uh, SPS measures, if I understand correctly, the FAO and IPPC have been working on e-certification uh, of uh, agricultural documentation because uh, that area more than anything else uh, sometimes requires physical inspection or verification of the veterinary signatures. So I guess the question is, is the WTO seeking to convene or is there any forum that brings together uh, these entities or are we dependent on the ICC or ad hoc uh, meetings at all. We all have a tendency, I dare say, in this forum to think in WTO-centric terms, and it's a much more heterogeneous uh, universe of uh, international regulators uh, and jurisdictions that all have a piece of this. So maybe you can share uh, everything you've said in that broader context. Thanks. Yes, so on, on that point, this is a very good point, and I think one that you should uh, make to our senior management. <laughs> uh, 
uh, we so I am working with these different entities. I'm in contact with them um, to keep track of, of what's being done. And this is one of the things that I, I was saying in my 2018 publication that I've been trying to push since then is that we need to work with these different entities and we need to make sure that we coordinate, align and all work in the same direction. Um, I launched a global trade and blockchain forum, the first one took place in 2019 that brought together those different players. And actually that was very, very nice because at the end, someone took the floor and said, well, actually this is the first time that I have all these stakeholders, all these people in the same room. I've been talking to them independently, but it's great to all be together. But it has stayed there for the moment, at least at our level at WTO. My hope is that we can do more and we can go further. But for that, the support of senior management is, is critical. The ICC has been um, very, very active and sort of taking the lead on that. Um, they launched the ICC Digital Standards Initiative. Um, the, the name is, um, is actually somewhat misleading because they go beyond uh, digital standards. Um, we are participating in the governing board of, uh, of this initiative. Um, and the idea is really to bring those different actors together and make sure that indeed, when we work on, um, on the standards, um, we all work in the same direction, make sure that the, the different approaches align. We work very closely with UNC trial uh, to try and promote the model on electronic transferable records um, and uh, try to explain why it is important to uh, transpose it at a national level. Um, and the uh, the LEI is uh, yeah I mean the uh, the, the GLAIF, uh, is also very uh, very active actually in the context of the ICCDSI. So it's a, on a more practical level. Uh, work on that front is driven very much by the ICC through the ICCDSI. Um, but I do think there is a greater role that could be played also by an organization like uh, like the WTO on uh, on this. And clearly. Um, coordinating with all these organizations is, is critical. So a very quick uh, follow-up and Deborah may have some observations. You didn't mention uh, regionalization versus globalization, not in the decoupling sense, but if I understand correctly, for example, Eunice may have insights as well. Singapore through a public-private partnership has made itself into a leading digital mm -hmm. hub by integrating standards across the board, but that's more applicable to those supply chains in that region. I don't think it necessarily has prospects of being universalized. So what are the risks of having a patchwork uh, of regional arrangements, EU similarly working on its own as it always does. Uh, it is a risk. It is a risk. And I see it. Uh, and I do think that we, we need to act um, in, uh, in a more decisive way at a multilateral level to avoid that, um, that risk of fragmentation. Yeah. It's... Um, as you said, Singapore is going ahead at full speed. They're very, very active. And by the way, they're also financing the ICCDSI. Um, the, uh, yes, the EU is uh, going its own way. China is going its own way on these, uh, on these issues. Um, so I, I think bringing the different actors around the table would, would probably be good to avoid that, that fragmentation. It's not there yet, but the risk is there. Okay, thanks. Anyone else uh, uh, who has questions? Can I just make a quick point on that last issue? Yeah. So yeah, Singapore right. is not active across all of the areas necessarily that, that uh, you just discussed, but in some areas, definitely. And in particular, what they've tried to do on some of the supply chain connectivity is say, if we could get the, mate, the three major maritime ports, just those three, you could actually get somewhere. So let's start with sort of three main ports or let's start with proof of concept by key carrier lines because there aren't that many maritime carrier lines right now. So you could, you could get those guys to do it. If you could potentially get some key finance institutions because they're, especially the ICC is obsessed with trade finance. 
if you could deal with it that way, rather than, I mean, it would be lovely to have a sort of come together and everybody creates a lovely regulatory framework. But in the meantime, could we start with some proof of concept among key private actors working together with governments, then you might actually get somewhere. So that's, that's the approach that I think Singapore has been taking is to say, not do the whole universe, but let's take some key areas and see how far we can get towards this. But obviously if we're not careful, we do end up with fragmentation instead of harmonization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and it's true. I mean, they have a very pragmatic approach. And I think, I mean, when it comes to Singapore, their approach is, is a global one. I mean, they do want to try and digitalize trade because they realize that if you need to be too to tangle, right? <laughs> so they, they can take a lot of measures at their level, but if others don't do the same, they won't go very far. And they're very active, very pragmatic, uh, launching proofs of concept with different entities, I mean, be it with, uh, with different countries, be it with Australia or the Netherlands, for example, so on different continents. Um, but that risk is there with some other jurisdictions, I would say. Okay, thanks. Stuart, please. Yeah, thanks, uh, Lou, and thank you very much, Emmanuel. That was absolutely uh, fascinating. Just uh, following up on the same uh, vein, um, I'm, I'm just wondering to what extent there is any focus on this area in trade agreements. I mean, we're reading a lot now about <laughs> digital economic um, agreements and, and that sort of thing more and more Countries get involved in that. We have the JSI negotiations in Geneva on e-commerce, which is, of course, is much wider than e-commerce. And in fact, they're talking about some of the issues mentioned, like trust and security and all of this. So, uh, is there anything that you know that's going on in that sort of um, bilateral trade or, or plurilateral trade area? Yes, yeah, so on that question, well, trade agreements are technology neutral, so um, they won't, well, to some extent, although there are some specific uh, annexes on the AI, for example, in, in DEPA, but uh, the, the different uh, provisions that are included in trade agreements uh, on uh, paperless trade or, uh, or digital trade do, do matter, and there's an increasing number of those. Now, the latest trade agreements in, uh, in the Asian uh, or Asia-Pacific region, the, the DPA, for example, or DEA, are very interesting. They, they break new ground and they go much further uh, when it comes to, to digital technologies, um, digital standards, uh, et cetera. Uh, so I think there's an increasing interest in having these issues being part of the, the trade agreements. Um, some, some issues um, I think could go further uh, for example, DPA touches upon the issue of digital identities, but in a very light way. And this is not even discussed in the context of the e-commerce negotiations. Um, and I hope that one day it will, because I do think it is important. Um, there, there are, I mentioned the MLETR, for example, there was an attempt by Singapore uh, to, to push this issue in the context of the e-commerce uh, GSI last year. And they took it off the table because they felt that it would be too complex to get an agreement on that. There is now a renewed push by the UK in the context of the G7 um, to, to do so. Let's see whether it goes further. Uh, but as I said, this is a critical issue that is currently not covered by the e-commerce negotiations, but should definitely, if we want to digitalize trade, it, it has to be there. Um, so increase attention to these issues, but I think we can go further. Thanks. But it ended up too, is there somewhere even informally among some groups or uh, as a workshop under some committees we are already discussing this or this is still, because I see you do talk about on this what? On, on, on blockchain and trade basically. So I've organized uh, several uh, events at the WTO, a research workshop in 2018 and a Global Trend Blockchain Forum in 2019 and another one in, in March of this year. Uh, to try and, and bring these issues. Uh, they, I was invited, for example, also to speak in the context of the um, Committee on Rules of Origin on this mm -hmm. issue. So there are a few things here and there, um, but I think much more could be done uh, mm -hmm. in that respect. And what I hope is that the new administration will give it uh, more, more support um, because we can definitely do much more and we should be doing much more, uh, I think, on, on these issues if we want to put in place uh, the right enabling environment uh, for, um, for trade digitalization. 
Okay. On I'll that, put down uh, a few thoughts and we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on that, I think uh, Annabelle is in charge of your division, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. they, you have the best person to talk to from the senior management. She, she was yeah. our member, uh, our member, uh, a member of our group, and also she still remains close to our group. So, so I think that's excellent. Anyway, else, do we have any questions? Uh, I see Alejandro came late. I think you have plenty of questions. You don't. I don't have <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, I. If none, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, could you, yeah, could you kindly uh, send us your PPT so together with sure. the video we could share, share with our group members who could not participate. Sure. Uh, yeah, and also as we say that we will put this also on YouTube so as to benefit. Uh, uh, more uh, to understand this and and also to 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 see how we can help to drive this discussion forward. Of course, I think uh, we will in discuss internally, and uh, I'm sure, uh, as I say, uh, myself and others are still struggling to uh, visualize this in potential future that to activities or even rule making or any other things to promote this. But uh, but uh, probably we could come back later with more questions and we could also. Uh, again, invite you to do this kind of work. I'm happy to yeah. brainstorm further on that. I'm, uh, I'm yeah. also working on a couple of other research projects, um, yeah. on one including with the, with the WEF uh, on trade tech in trade agreements, So, uh, uh, which should be done at the end of the year, early next year. So all the questions you, that you had on RTAs are very relevant. <laughs> we're, we're looking into that. So, okay. Yeah. That's that's great. We look forward to to reading that. Okay. With this, thanks a lot, Emmanuel. And well, thank uh, you very much. Yeah, I I'll, I'll invite Bye. you for lunch one day. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye Emmanuel. Thank you.